Andrew, first of all, I want to thank you so much for allowing me to just get to visit with you about your story when it comes to real estate and how it's changed your life. Because if anybody's life has been changed positively from owning and being in the real estate field, it's been you. I mean, you got some really good stories about how, A, you got started, your journey, maybe some bumps. But I think you look at your bumps with a lot of wisdom instead of like push, pulling the rip cord and say, I'm out. Like you, you saw the long vision, which is, I think, important in real estate. And then you're in the business too. You're a your mortgage uh, lender and you know how to finance these things. And you've done some pretty neat creative stuff in that regard too, that I think we'll, we'll want to touch later, maybe on another episode. But today, I would love the opportunity for you just to share your story about how you started, why you started, and your fears, your your experiences, you know, all the all the stuff that everybody wants to know that's not doing it right now. And and you know, I like talking to honest people and you're an honest guy when it comes to your story. So tell us about who you are first and then and let's jump into it. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks for having me first. Yeah. It's an honor for me to be here, of course. Yeah. So you. I've been in real estate investing for 22 years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've invested during 9-11. Mm -hmm. I invested, bought houses, I invested during the housing crisis. I'm investing now. I am a lender. The mm -hmm. Being a lender has helped me become a real estate investor mm -hmm. to a better one. But how I got started when I grew up as a kid, uh, you know, it was like the tale of two fathers. Mm -hmm. It was the best of times and it was the worst of times. Not really. It was the best of times and it was still a pretty good old time mm -hmm. over here, too. So my dad... Uh, was an experimental electrical engineer. We traveled around the country, did all these crazy projects. Like one of them, he worked on floating nuclear power plants. And even to this day, he's like, it, it would have worked, you know, um, that's just my dad. So yeah. we moved around a lot. And at the time, if you moved, we sold our home mm -hmm. to buy the next one. Makes sense. Yeah. My uncle, though, he moved around too, except he kept his homes. Now, as a young kid, there wasn't much difference between us and them. I'll right. go to my uncle's house and all right, he was a little bit better off. But as I got older, the gap between us got bigger, bigger, and bigger. I, I can imagine. Now that, yeah, now that my dad is retired and my uncle is retired, my uncle has a significantly different life. Mm -hmm. And that's where I got my inclination to even get started in real estate was from my uncle. I saw what he had and I was like, yeah, I think that's the direction I want to go. And Kyle, he retired with Seven, seven properties. Yeah, it, it's amazing what it, it doesn't have to be a huge number, no. but uh, yeah, that, that's amazing. It's it's great to have that opportunity to see that and see it in real life and how it, how it works in somebody's life because a lot of people don't have that example in their life. Yeah, yeah, and and I, you know, I had a very loving family. Mm -hmm. You know, my parents were great, but nobody told them any different. They mm -hmm. hey, just go to your corporate job and work it, and you'll be okay. And that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. When my dad retired. He's an average retired person. And right now, an average retired person between 55 and 65 has about 90,000 in their savings for retirement. Mm -hmm. That's not enough. Yeah. You've got to do something else. you got to. So what'd you do? Well, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I went to college and I bought my first home. It was a $50,000, three bedroom, one bath home. And it, it's kind of crazy for me to think about my real estate agent at the time. It was just like a TV show. He showed me three houses and told me to pick one. The price point was so low for him. He's like, this is barely worth my time. I'm not yeah. having any money on you. Um, so three houses and then we're done. And mm -hmm. that was fine. I chose the one house that gave me a down payment assistance program. That's how I chose. So I even then, I was a college student. I had a part-time job, not enough money to purchase a home without help from the government. And I used a down payment program to get to my first home on a low rate. And I house hacked it. I rented out one room for half the mortgage and the other room for half the mortgage. And I lived rent free, yeah, housing free. I, I did a very similar story with a duplex. Yeah. Yep. And then after I graduated college, I, re I kept renting out the home. Hmm. And then I sold it several years later and bought more real estate with the proceeds. Mm -hmm. And that's how I leveraged one home to buy many. Now, were you astute enough yet to know about 1031 exchanges? No, no. It was my own primary home too. So, oh, yeah. So you got the tax free. Mm -hmm. Two out of the yeah. past five. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I saw what was crazy. The person who bought it from me 
bought it as a cash out purchase, not a cash out refund. This is during the, you know, yeah. before the heyday. So the, yeah, 06. So he bought it and got money back <laughs> and he went and bought more houses too. So he was a real estate investor mm -hmm. as well. And he still owns it to this day, renting it. But I used that money, tax free money, mm -hmm. and leveraged it for more. Okay. So what'd you buy? So the next home that I purchased, I purchased a townhouse in Jacksonville, Florida. In this townhouse, my wife and I, we went there. This was 07. We went toward the properties and they were asking 175 for this these townhouses, you know? And they were nice. And we're like, eh, not if we think we'll we'll pass. So the next year, 08, when everything started getting crazy, mm -hmm. they called us like, hey, financing fell through on one of our homes. Shocker. Uh, would you like to look at we show we show you were interested the year before. Would you like to come look at it for 135? And we went Big back. Nice. Yeah. And my wife and I, we I distinctly remember us saying, you know, house prices are going down, but they won't go down much further, right? Wrong. Wrong. So wrong. But we bought that home not with the intent to flip it or to do anything with it, except to purchase it as a rental. Mm -hmm. So it was zero down. 7% interest rate in a homeowners association in 08. Like, could I have done anything else more wrong than yeah. this property? I did almost everything wrong. Mm -hmm. It's a two bedroom, two and a half bath home, but you know, it's fine. It's always rented. I never lost anything on that home, even though for five years I was just hammered with the depreciation of the asset. I couldn't refinance out of the 7%. Mm -hmm. So it was upset. I couldn't sell right. it because yeah. I was upside down. And now all of that was okay because the math we did in the beginning was like, hey, we're going to lose like 50 bucks, 100 bucks a month, but at the end, we'll have 100,000. Mm -hmm. So this year, Kyle, is the year I'm selling it. And we're going to clear like 128 on it. So for 15 years, I've had it as a rental. I came out of pocket zero to buy it. And I'm going to clear enough to go buy two more rental properties. Nice. I'm still leveraging my own homes to buy more investment properties. Right. Trade it up. The monopoly business model. That's it, man. Come on so, to Big Red Hotel. So, um, I mean, you, you got hammered on the value. And that oh, yeah. and that's where everybody says, well, no, I'm not going to buy right now because next year things are going to be the buying opportunity. And, and nobody has a crystal ball. And even if, you know, three years ago, three years in the future, it does go down, that down might still be higher than where we're at now. So nobody has a crystal ball. So looking back, I mean, even though the value went down significantly, it was still a great Great opportunity for you because you got you in the game. You got all the benefits of owning, you know, taxes, pr principal pay down, cash flow. You have it, right? Is that kind of how the story goes? Yeah, man. This is not a get rich quick scheme. That's not what real estate is. Yeah. This is long term. And, and you're in this business too, right? Mm -hmm. Every successful real estate investor we know lives slightly beneath their means, maybe even mm -hmm. greater beneath yeah. their means, because all we need to do is just not mess up the plan. Mm -hmm. Buy real estate, hold it for a long time, and be a multimillionaire. Just yeah. don't screw that up, and you'll be mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that delayed gratification is the biggest piece of the puzzle because it's so easy to want to go do something with that. If you sold that first house tax free, you're like, hey, I got some good money here. That car looks pretty nice. Like, I, that whole delayed gratification, if you can conquer that piece of human nature, you can win really easily. I have a feeling like if somebody is here watching this broadcast, they're here for a reason. Like mm -hmm. a person who's not thinking about what you just mentioned is not here. Mm -hmm. They're out having a great time. Yeah. So if you're here and this is something you're feeling, that's that's the promise that's already there. You can do this too. Just listen to things like this. Because for us early in our career, we didn't mm -hmm. have nothing like this. There was nothing. nothing. We had to learn it on our own and make all these mistakes, you're still going to make some mistakes, but they're going to be significantly smaller than what we did. And you're going to be just fine. Yeah. So did you have anybody tell you you were making a mistake? No. You didn't? I mean, no, there, there was nobody even, there was nobody even asked, mm -hmm. Kyle. There was nobody there. I went to the library and checked out a book. It was eight years old. It was already outdated. Mm -hmm. Like I had nothing to go off of. I remember I called around like real estate company. Really, and it was, oh yeah, we, you can invest in real estate with us. Cool. How how much does it cost? Quarter of a million. I'm like, well, who's got a quarter of a million dollars just laying around? Mm -hmm. I and mean, some people do. The way that I got started was with hardly any money because mm -hmm. that's all the money I had. 
Yeah. And my risk was lower too. So I started small. That's the only thing I could afford. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you have to somebody that was starting out? It sounds like you kind of already given some of it. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, I mean, this is a broad audience, right? So oh, everybody's, yeah. everybody everybody wants listens. to listen to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you don't own real estate, the place I might suggest for you to think about starting is your own primary home. Because if you don't own real estate, you don't even know if this is something you're going to like. Mm -hmm. Like, what if you hate it? Let's start with your primary house first. That'll at least get you some understanding about real estate in a different way. Mm -hmm. And if you do own your primary home, look at the returns on your stocks, your 401ks, and how volatile it is. You've seen what your house can do. If you own your home already, you've seen how much it appreciated. So multiply that by 10 or 15. And you tell me if you want to get into real estate. Mm -hmm. That's the answer. And income tax return time. It, it's nice to be able to get a little little back from Uncle Sam. When you when you pay rent, you don't get it. It's gone. Twenty something years I've been investing in real estate. Mm -hmm. I've never paid a cent of income tax on my rental properties. They're great tax mm -hmm. deductible assets. Mm -hmm. So it's an amazing platform to really multiply your dividends on it. So tell me about maybe. So real estate has impacted your life, you know, I would say positively from what I'm hearing. What way, like we saw how your uncle's financial life was impacted versus your father's. Like, do you feel that you are less scared about the future than maybe somebody else your age? Or do you feel, how do you think real estate's really impacted you as far as your, your life? There's a lot of things to this answer, right? So there's, to me, I, you know, I'm a Marine. There's a lot of military people that have a hard time mm -hmm. mentally. So the financial piece of the puzzle here is a small piece. I still got to have a good spirit and be healthy up here, mm -hmm. you know, and have a good relationship with my family. Like those things are still required. And if mm -hmm. you become extraordinarily successful in real estate and your family's dysfunctional, real estate's not going to solve that. Yeah. It might make your family more dysfunctional. So part of this is a holistic way of looking at it. It sounds weird, but Having money doesn't solve all of your problems, but it does solve a lot of them, mm -hmm. especially the worrisome ones, like the bills and what am I going to do? Yeah. You know, those things, it does help you feel more comfortable to tackle the higher level things that we need to address in our social and mental states. Mm -hmm. So it's given me some stressless days, they're yeah. not stress free. And it's hard being at this level it is like i'm always in demand and always being pulled from and no matter how much my property manager manages my properties yeah i'm still needed i'm Absolutely. still needed yeah it's so a partnership being wealthy is kind of hard mm -hmm. but so is being poor mm -hmm. so if being poor is hard and being wealthy is hard just choose which hard you want yeah because one has a significantly higher uh ceiling than the other so it has helped me financially, but it's also given me the ability to tackle these other things that are, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, sure. the higher triangle, like oh, yeah. the things I can't describe. Those yeah. have been reachable because the bottom levels of needs have been satisfied. Yeah. Right. So you, you've got a, a good number of years of real estate behind you. What are you doing now in real estate? What What is it that you're looking for in your investments now? Has it changed much since initial? from earlier? And if so, how? And are you buying mansions? Or are you buying like, you know, blue collar homes? What are you, what are you doing? Yeah. So when I first, the first, you know, hey, I bought my first one was 50 mm -hmm. grand. My next one was 135. My next one was 30,000. The one after that was 30,000. Mm -hmm. So all of my homes in the beginning were very entry level homes. They taught me a lot. I don't own any more $30,000 homes anymore. Right. So what I've been doing through the years is selling one home to buy two or selling one home to upgrade the asset to a more right. profitable asset. And I'm at, at this plateau where in our market, we're in Dallas, Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. So we know that a three bedroom, two bath home under 300,000 is a pretty good rental. Yeah. And that's the target acquisition level that we want to have. The piece of the puzzle that I'm doing now is I'm still upgrading my properties, but like I own one that's built in 1928. It, and it's a three one. The 1928 home always has issues. Yeah. So I'm going to sell that one this year and buy two more. So early on, the first home was really hard, Kyle. Second home was hard. Third home was, man, they were all, but eventually 
I got it a lot easier. Like around seven or eight or nine, the engine starts feeding itself. It does. And now I'm selling two homes this year to buy four. And in five years, I'll sell those four homes to buy eight. So every five years now, I'm doubling my properties. And that's using the money from real estate. That's not that's not necessarily putting money into real estate. So that that first house fed the machine that kept going. And I think that's where some people get confused and like your 401k, you're putting money in every single paycheck. And in real estate, if you play your cards right, yeah, there's an, there's some investment, but it, your investment pays for your investments going forward, which is very unique out there. It's like owning a business, but it's, it's a little less stressful, more predictable. It's an old joke, but you know, how do you make a million dollars by spending two million? Yeah. We don't do that on real estate. We spend a very little amount and then wait, and then we make huge amounts. Right. So I'm still using that same formula. I just got to stay on track. Don't ruin the plan. And I'm going to be extraordinarily well off at the end of the game. Yeah. So what's the end of the game look like for you? So at 60, I'll be selling 16 homes a year Mm -hmm. for five years. I'll be making 1.6 million a year. When I pass, all of my family will get a house. Nice. Um, It's already, I've already got, you know, it's already mapped out Mm -hmm. and, you know, things change. Yeah. But uh, let's say I don't make 1.6, I only make one. Uh, poor me. Yeah. I well, think, you shoot for the stars, you, you or moon, you end up with the stars. So yeah. yeah. I think everything's going to be fine as long. And, and I'm a regular job, right? I have my regular job. I'm not quitting my job. I have satisfaction in my job. Mm-hmm. And there's plenty of clients that I, I have too, Kyle. They are they're like some of them work for charities. They make 50, 60,000 a year and they have several rental properties. Mm-hmm. So it's not like, Real estate solves these things that we have. Like if you don't have job satisfaction, get a good job that you like and then do real estate on the side and you can still be very, very successful just doing that. I've got a good number of clients that have multiple rental houses that were, they're just a school teacher. Yeah. You know, and it's not, you don't have to be wealthy to start. You get wealthy from starting and, you know, getting that first house and just like you said, house hacking it and then move on to the next one. And I got just keeping it. And, you know, I love the, what you're talking about, you know, giving a house to each person in your family when you pass, that makes a huge impact on somebody other than just giving them a check for whatever your state says. Like that could be life changing. Cause I've got a client or I had a client who passed away from pancreatic cancer and he left his, his properties in a trust for his two daughters. And he didn't just give the money. He gave them an income source for however long, for forever, I guess. And um, that I think makes a huge impact on somebody. So I know his daughters have less stress in their lives as a result of having that direct deposit hit their bank account every month. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of things that are beyond us that we get to do with real estate. And, you know, I've got my things that I want to do. And so I think that having that real estate allows you to do things that you wouldn't have done otherwise, especially on the flexibility of retirement. Like you're going to have a little bit more freedom. You get to go to Cabo more often. That's right, man. Yeah. And it's not just a little bit more freedom. Like it seems a little bit in the beginning, mm-hmm. but after a while, that gap just gets huge at yeah. the end. It's just it's a such, snowball. Yeah. What would you say about your education on learning how to do more real estate better? You know, we mm-hmm. talking about you, we kind of talked about barbecue, and a lot of people don't think of barbecue as real estate, but I've seen that as a commonality with a lot of real estate investors. I don't know why. I just see it. I see it with Tim Heritage. I see it with you. I see it with. Joe Fenary, which we'll get on him, get him in here too later. And me, like, tell us about how you continue learning about real estate networking. We can't go to college for this, man. There's mm-hmm. no school for this. You can only go out there and do it. Yeah. So the first ten years or so, when I was doing that, you know, I'm in the desert. There's nobody to help. I, like I said, I, I tried everything I could to learn from somebody, and there wasn't there. And then the internet got really good. It got a lot more informative and user friendly. And now there's all these networking groups that are around. And some of them, you don't even have to be in person. They're online. Reaching out to other real estate investors to learn what they're doing, that's what got me better. That's what got me much better. At my job as a loan officer, I worked for a broker for a while. That also helped too. So being in the industry does help as well. But the first time that I went to a real estate group and they were doing what I was already doing, except I was kind of struggling with it, Mm -hmm. but they were doing it well. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Give me t- 
talk to me about this some more. And that's why it's so important for us to network with each other, lean on each other, share stories about what we're doing. Even if it's not the same exact story for each of us, we're all different. We still learn and get better. That's the only way I know how to do it is by other people's examples. And I think that's a good good point you bring up is everybody's a little different. I think people have in their head that being a real estate investor is this it's one thing. And that's, you know, buy the rent house and hold it and buy rent house and hold it. But there are so many facets of real estate that people just aren't even aware of. Like the group that that we I look forward to it every month. Like get uh, and I hate that I miss this month because I was I was on, I was in California. I had a great time, but I missed out. But um we get together once a month, we get barbecue. Everybody at that table has a very different business model. I mean, there's usually seven to nine, 10 of us, sometimes low would be six. Every one of us has a different business model, completely different business model. But I've learned something from every single person at that table, whether it's how they acquire property, how they finance property. And there's a lot of different ways to finance property, which I want to have you back again in the future to talk about what you're able to do on your side as far as financing. Because I think it's very valuable because. I mean, you're one of the top guys in the country. I know you're humble about that, but then you're also a big speaker on financing. So I think it'll be great to have you on for that. But just sitting around the table and listening to somebody do owner financing and uh, subject twos and wholesale deals and buying distress and fixing them up. You know, there's there's a lot of that, and there's you know some risk and rewards in that. And then there's people that just buy brand new spanking houses and just sit on them. So there's just a lot of different people and. You learn from every single person that you hang out with. So yep. I appreciate you putting that group together too. No problem, man. Yeah, it's a great group. And that's why these kind of podcasts are so mm-hmm. important too. Because now, now you can be doing your laundry or on the treadmill, treadmill or out yeah. running, listening to this and getting smarter. You can be multitasking when you don't even need to be multitasking, but you're getting smarter and better at real estate. It's yep. a it's a really important facet of it. So and then you're talking about the websites out there. And I found one that I really have seen a lot of value in the bigger pockets. I've seen you on there a lot. So that's been a really good resource. I know a lot of our clients come from there because that's how they they realize they they research their market and they don't live where they invest, but they invest where's the best place. And that's how we end up with a lot of our clients are because they realize DFW is a good good place. And and I see you on a lot answering a lot of people's pretty in-depth questions. Like you you put out a lot of good content out there. So that's a good place to research. Yeah. If you're new, that's a great site to be on. Absolutely. Yeah. What are what are some books that that you feel are good starter books for somebody? Kyle, I don't know if I should admit this. I've never read a book. There you go. No, admit it. That's the whole point. Yeah. yeah. The first time uh, I think I shared, I went to the library and I checked out a book, and I I put I was like this. That's the only time I even tried to read a book. Mm-hmm. So somebody said, "Man, your, your uncle thing. That's like Rich Dad Poor Dad." I'm like, "Oh, that sounds cool. I never read that. It's- I've never read any of those things." Rich so- uncle Poor. For dad, yeah. Yeah, that's it, whatever. But it's like rich uncle and yeah. being okay father. You know, mm-hmm. he's still fine. But um, yeah, I've, ne- I've never read anything. I've, I'm a, I, that's me. Okay. Mm-hmm. So for me, I'm a learn by doing type of person. Yeah. And that's how I have been successful. Cool. That's great. Well, man, I, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your experience and your, your story, especially because I think there's a lot of value in the, hey, you bought something and it went way down. But you didn't lose money, and I think that's mind blowing to some people. And I think that's a, an amazing story to be able to say that, hey, that house is buying two houses this year with equity, and you're just going to snowball it. So I, I really appreciate you coming on, and explaining kind of your story and and where what your plans are. I love the way you have it all figured out. Like you've got your life planned out way better than I do. But uh, <laughs> I, 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 I love that you'd come on and share, and you're an open book. So if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, because yeah. Because you're in the industry and you're, you're a mortgage guy. So how would they get a hold of you? Okay. Yep. So my full name is Andrew Postel, P-O-S-T-E-L-L. You can Google me. I work for Guaranteed Rate. I'm on YouTube. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. You can reach out to me in any way. My personal direct phone number, 817-380-1913. Call me anytime. Here to help. Great. Thanks. And I will give you a plug. I had somebody, a family member come to me and say, hey, we need to help our friend get financing for something that we don't think they'll be able to afford anymore because they had some health issues, some job issues, good people, had income, but it, just whatever, life hit them. And uh, I, I was like, I don't know how to get that financed for you, but Andrew will know the answer if it's possible. And then 
come to find out you you did the deal. I was I was very pro- and I appreciate you helping out my my family friends on that. Thanks for even thinking of me, man. Yeah. That means a lot to me. Of appreciate course. you. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll be seeing you in the next couple of days anyway, because we always network. That's right. All right. Take it easy. Thank you. See you, man. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.